slides visible, please? Yes, please put it on the screen. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So let's have a little change now, pediatric cataract surgery. Let's, let's go and see. So during the talk, I want to cover a few things now. What, what is a pediatric cataract? Why does it occur? Which cases to operate? It's not that you see a speck in the eye, you can jump to operate. When to operate, how to operate, and who should operate? I think that last one is very important. We'll come to that a little later. So when you look at this slide, you, what you see is you see a, a gamut of uh, patients. You can get patients which, which have a cataract at the birth, or you can have patients which have... Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. I think I, I shared the wrong slides. Okay. So, okay. So the pediatric cataract has an have, has a epidemiology. Uh, 1 to 15 in 10,000 births will have cataract. So that's not that rare. And this was the data which was about uh, in 1997. What we see now is that I think the number has increased. What, whatever be the factor, it could be the genetic factor, it could be the familial, it could be the consanguous marriages, or it could be the, the nutritional uh, nutrition given to the mothers during pregnancy. This is on the rise. Why is happening? We don't know exactly. So the blindness earlier used to be in one to four in 10,000 in the developed world and five to 15 in the developing nation. But right now I feel that it's becoming a universal thing. It's happening everywhere. Okay. So because the populations are going and they're migrating from one place to another. So you keep get set of patients. So what exactly is congenital cataract? It could be a congenital. When it's picked up at birth or as early as three to six months, they have nystagmus, they have squint. They're usually nuclear and polar. And the emblopia is very, very dense in these ones. The other group could be when they start going to the school, when the parents pick it up, the vision is low, subnormal. They don't have abnormal movements like nystagmus or squint. And they're usually zonular and lamellar, and they have very good visual prognosis. It's a universal phenomena. So with this in mind, I think WHO, uh, WHO has got Vision 2020, in which they want that each kid has to be taken seriously because treating a child is as good as treating 10 adults. So why do we get it? The answer is we still do not know that why we get in all the patients. They could be unilateral, bilateral. The majority are idiopathic. Idiopathic, it could be sounding like idiotopathic because we are still idiots. We're not able to find out why it's happening in so many people. But yes, majority of them are still idiopathic. So I think that is what we have to see. So we, the only thing we can do is can make the media clear in them. Okay. So there are certain associations which we've seen, and this was a paper which came from Australia in which they found out that uh, about 2.2 in 10,000 will have a familial or a syndromic cataract. And these are some syndromic cataracts. I'll just show you some examples. So Nansen-Heron syndrome can be easily picked up if you dilate the parents, especially the mother's eyes, and see a distant direct. And that's, that's about it. If you do it, you can pick, it, pick this up. And this was the mother's eye, which had a 618 vision, and she never bothered to get herself operated. Downs is the commonest syndromic uh, cataract seen. Rubella is again on the rise. We are picking up, we're getting lots of patients coming with the rubella, and especially typically a microphthalmic, a non dilating pupil with a cataract, which is partially absorbed, like, like a post uveitic cataract, is what we get in these patients. And get a cardiology evaluation, you can pick up a PDA. So, which one to operate? The one which are more than three millimeter and blocking the central pupil. The posterior polar cataracts are the ones should be operated because they usually block the vision because they're close to the nodal point. And if the nystagmus or strabismus present, you should go and operate these patients. So this patient on dilatation, we found a cataract, but the central part is clear, can wait. Now, these are different kinds of zonulars. You can see one zonular here, second, third, and fourth. The, the second and the fourth need not be operated. So in this one, you can easily pick up the first has to be operated. The fourth has to be operated. The second one, in case there's a deviation, has to be operated and keep a close follow-up. Whereas the third one, you can actually wait on this one uh, on a strict follow-up. If you operate them very early, less than one month, there are always chances of high chances of glaucoma in these patients later on. There's a high risk of apnea in these patients. So they should be operated. Uh, ideal age is about 12 weeks, which is an ideal in this one. And unilateral should be operated a little bit earlier than the bilateral. So basically, when the leukocoria patient comes to you, you have to check out whether this is in the cornea, in the lens, or in the, in, in the vitreous. So these are the tests which you can check out. The best test in this uh, ultrasound, which can give you a, uh, lots of uh, for information. There's a bilateral cataract. This also the bilateral leukocoria, but this is a bilateral RD. Now, this is another sign which you can pick up. If you look at this patient's eye, you see the opacity comes and goes. It's like a shifting, like a fleeting kind of leukocoria. So this is basically not in the lens. It's behind the lens. So that's why it's, it's, it's a very important sign that you need a VR guy to stand next to you. 
the lot, certain investigations can be done which are tailor made the important thing i'm going to show you is how to do a proper eua in these patient because without a cc examination there's no point in operating this patient because you don't know what these you're getting into so once the child is under you have to do a keratometry of both the eyes and that's what we is being done we do both eyes simultaneously after the keratometry we start checking the white to white uh, diameter of these eyes because if the white to white is less than say 9 9.5 9 mm uh, Uh, in one of the meridians then we don't put implant in these patients so that's what is checked and all the children have to undergo all the standard uh, ua technique so once you measure both the eyes then you can switch over to the exilent and the contact thing should be done at the last so you do a contact biometry with which you can pick up exilent and at the end of all these surgeries at our center now we do a ubm in all these patients even if the uh, cul de sac is small we can put is on one lid on one side and push the lid to another side with the cup and you can actually get a good image so that's how the ubm is done and and that's what was the paper we presented in 2019 which was what a award for this uh, ubm findings in pediatric cataract okay so i'll show you some ubm findings so this is a, a typical zonular cataract you can see the central part is clear which can be picked up on the ubm as well now this one has a central yeah, calcification okay. which can that's easily uh... picked up on the ubm uh, somebody's uh, uh i think mike is on please can you put them to mute please thank you very much now this is the one which doesn't look like a zonal cataract you see it's a, like a looks like a partially absorbed but on seeing the ubm you find that the entire volume of the lens is intact so this is not a absorbed cataract yet whereas this patient has a, a morganian cataract which is actually floating in the front and this is like a entire nucleus which is floating around okay now what is how to operate is very important because the surgical concept is to clear the central area so that the light goes and stimulates the retina that's one second you have to remove all the scaffolds which can form a pco later on and third even if you're not able to put the lens at this stage you should be having enough support so that you can go in a visit again and do a secondary eye in these ones and should be least traumatic and minimum complications so what you need is a surgical so this is where my surgery starts i start with a ubm so this is the lens in which you can see actually there's a little loss of volume and we do all the parameter check up and this was a lens which was actually very sticky cataract so that's why i picked it up so you make a three incision all these surgeries see that i is trying to roll up so i had to tell my anesthesia guy to deepen it a bit i picked it up this important uh, video intentionally so that you have a good liaison with your uh, anesthesia team and once you got three incision in place you need to put a dash of air edri one in 10000 and then a little bit of dye so even if it's a clear lens it's best to put a dye because that will change the nature of the anterior capsule and it makes it less elastic and you can manage it well so then when you take out the dye you try to take out from the all the opening so i took it out put for one and took it for the other one so i have both the markings visible there there's no shortcut here you need to have a good viscoelastic i mean i use the uh, helon gv for all my patients and then you see my microscope has a, a rexis assist which tells me that's my 5 mm rexis size there so i have to go 5 mm this is what is going to guide me you come from the side port always and give a nick which is going vertically down and just lift it up a little bit and leave it there because if you try to go with the cystinum alone it will wreck it will run away because it's so elastic to make an incision in this one i'm using a utrata forceps for my anterior capsular axis i'll use a longer forceps intravitreal for my posterior capsule you can use either for either of purpose i'm depending on what, what kind of dextery you have so now this is guiding me to make a mark why i'm putting a 5 mm mark because that will keep my lens at place in the bag so my eye will not come and get captured entirely if my rex is actually on top of that and eventually it gets fibrous and retracts to about a 10% of its size so 5 5.5 5 mm rex will become 4.5 and it'll keep the lens in check and never come in the front so that's so once that is done the next step is to do a hydro in these patients you do a hydro with with the, your viscoelastic cell inside the eye unlike the adults then by manual is the way to go and these are the by manuals which i use and uh, it is the same size which my incision is so there's no leakage there and, and if you notice this is not a typical soft cataract which comes out in a go it's like a putty it, it's like a little leathery cataract which is there so i'm rolling it up i lift up the thing in fact in fact the entire thing has rolled up like a boiled egg so once that's come up i'm going to eat it up slowly see my chamber is formed the pupil does not dilate too much but this is the size it maintained throughout the surgery and once this is gone then the next step is to do a posterior axis and for the posterior axis you have to underfill the bag 
And you notice that I again go from the main incision and I'm going to grasping it and going step by step. And posterior rex rexis never will run away. It will run away only in the patients in which you overfill the bag. So never overfill the bag. It's the chamber you have to form, but your rexis, your, 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 chamber, your bag has, has not to be overfilled. Don't push it backwards. So once this step is done, the next step is vitrectomy. And we do a high speed cut, uh, cutter with the 4,000 cuts, which I use on my Centurion machine. And once the vitrectomy is done, immediately after the vitrectomy is done, the next step, which I started doing now in all my patients is I go and inflate my bag and then I'll come with a, with a illuminator from my incision, main incision. And I go and take the picture and in fact, record the fundus finding of all my patients using a wide angle, which of course the retina guys are using right, left and center. And this is what you see. Now you can see, you can see the entire retina. So this kid is a six months old kid and it will never show you the retina I, uh, properly later on. So I have a data here. Now, whenever I see this, I know this was a patient who had a disc cupping. So we have come out with a paper on this also, which has been published in BMJ. I'll just show you a script of that. So we saw about 500 patients uh, with this and we could pick up all variety of uh, gamut of things which can be shared. Uh, I can share the files with you if we, time allows later on. And the lens has to go into the bag and the lens goes into the bag. This is a single piece going into the bag because anterior posterior axis, both are intact. So the lens will stay in the bag. And, and that's about it. Then you put the suture onto the main incision and the side incision, you can hydrate and the lens stays put in the eye. Okay. So this was the wide angle recording, which I was talking about. Now, this is a technique which has been published in BMJ. I'll send you over the soft copy and beautiful pictures you can see. I mean, you can see the entire gamut of everything. So you need not go into the vitreous all the way. Even if you in, if your posterior capsule intact, you can light can stay on the posterior capsule and with the light off and with the, uh, uh, with the inverter on, you can actually take all the retinal pictures. You can even scan the peripheries in, of these patients. So who should operate is very important because recently we, we had a paper in which we saw 1,000 patients and 10% of these patients had problems. 3% because of the complication of surgeries done by people outside. And there were high VO, about 7%. So about 10% people, one in every 100 patients will have a problem which need to be operated again. So I will prefer the people who operate these are through with a trained pediatric ophthalmologic surgery because it's not as, as simple as adult cataract. So they have to have a good anesthesia setup. A microscope vitrectomy machine has to be in a perfect condition, otherwise there's no point in going in and doing things halfway. You have to have an IOL inventory because most of the times your IOL will be decided on the table, the par. So you have to have a good inventory and great and a lifetime commitment as these kids will keep coming back for your EOAs, suture removals, glasses change and squint surgeries if needed in these patients. And good uh, small patients needs more patients. You have to be more patient with these patients and then uh, of course you can get good results. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, uh, 